Good morning, everyone. Uh, just so you know what has happened, this morning we filed 10 individual lawsuits for loved ones of these two families that basically took both of their families completely away from them. Those cases were filed in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois against Boeing and Rosemont Aerospace. Simultaneously, a claim was filed in each 10 of those cases at the FAA General Counsel Office in Des Plaines, Illinois, up near O'Hare Airport. What has brought us here today is this tragedy from March 10th. I first want to introduce everybody uh, that is here. Going from there, Haral Veda, Veda, Manat Veda, Veda, Paul Jagori, Frank Petrie with Kachetit Petrie, and Tracy Braumeyer from Clifford Law Offices. Uh, before they give statements, I'd like to talk briefly about the families. And perhaps, Jennifer, you can pull up the, uh, the PowerPoint. <clears throat> so this family made a decision they wanted to go have a great family vacation and go on a safari in Kenya. They all are Canadian citizens who live in the area of Toronto. That's Manat, father, mother, and his sister, his brother-in-law, and their two young nieces. Mr. Vita Penagash was a retired CEO of a company. Mrs. Dixit, again, all, everyone here was highly educated. College degree, uh, she was a loving mother, grandmother, Kosha, another college degree, Manat sister, worked in the Toronto area. Ashka and Dixit, they are both competitive swimmers, were competitive swimmers. They love music. Uh, Ashka particularly liked singing. Anushka was, played the trumpet. These poor folks here lost all three generations of their family, and not in her all, because of the absolute arrogance, lack of diligence, and carelessness and recklessness of the Boeing Corporation. Another picture? Okay. Oh, I think they can hear me. Okay. There's Manat's father and mother, Harrell's father in law and mother in law. Next. Keep going. There's all the family together with Manat and Harrell's children. They have a son and daughter. He'll tell you how they've affected them. This whole has affected them in addition to them. Next. Again, this is the whole family together. Next. Okay. I'm going to. So, why not? Mother and father and her own. Mother and father in law were on this flight his only sister, and his only nieces. This is three generations of his family has gone. Paul Gajore, sitting right here. He had, ba he had, they had a new baby, Ruby, who was nine months old. His mother-in-law came to Toronto area. They actually live in Hamilton, which is outside of Toronto. And she came to help them out for six months while they, with their three young children, because they both, Paul, Paul and his wife, Caroline, met. It's the only person he ever dated. Met in college at the University of Nairobi. Okay. Both, again, very educated. Manat is in the IT field. Okay. 
Narelle's in the um, human resources management. Paul works in investments. He's got his degrees in electrical, in uh, finance, economics, and he's a CPA. Manat has his degrees in electrical engineering. Very educated people. So they were, they made a decision that their grandparents who live in Kenya, the other grandparents had not seen Ruby since she was born nine months before. So Caroline, he was supposed to go and take them back, but they changed plans and Caroline took them to Kenya on that trip to go see their grandparents so they could see Ruby for the first time. And that's what brought them on that flight. Uh, they're all permanent residents of Canada. Kelly is a Canadian citizen. Actually, one of his daughters is a US citizen. I'll go through that. So he has Ryan. We can pull up a picture. We got Ryan, age six. This is a picture that was taken Christmas of 2018 in the Toronto area. He took the picture. That's his son, his wife. Caroline, Ruby, the nine-month-old, and his mother-in-law. Ann Karanja is his mother-in-law, who's uh, lived in Kenya but came to help. And Kelly, uh, four-year-old. Ryan was in first grade, like soccer. Kelly was four-year-old in kindergarten, like singing and dancing. And Ruby, Ruby just liked listening to Kelly sing. These are... Um, Two terrific families. He's lost his entire immediate family as a result of this arrogance, negligence of Boeing that we are seeing. And we saw again this morning. So I have a few things to say about what happened this morning. There was a shareholders conference here in Chicago, and the CEO gave a press conference where he said, I am confident that our design of the 737 MAX and certification of the MAX was done properly. Can you imagine the gall of saying that over all these reports and obvious evidence of a defect in this aircraft? Before he said April 6th, excuse me, March, April 6th in an interview, he said, we own this. This is our problem. He's changed his tune and said this morning, we are just a link in a chain of events. He was asked questions by reporters. He was asked questions by reporters. Was your link negligence? Were you at fault? He refused to answer that question today. Then he had the gall to say, we're going to make this plane even safer, implying that this plane was safe on the date these folks' loved ones were killed. Are you kidding? Tell that to the 346 Families of the 346 people who passed away either in the Lion Air case or in the Ethiopian airline crash. Then he said, I am confident in our certification process. Well, we are not, these families are not, okay? They are not confident. And if they're confident that their certification progress, process was so good, we can have no confidence in them in any further operation or certification of this aircraft. We need outside authorities, outside oversights, independent oversight of any certification process by this, if, if they're going to attempt to put this plane back into service, which they apparently are. And it seems when I heard the conference this morning, they were more concerned about, they talked more about how they want to get the plane back in service, their safe plane, even safer, back in service and making sales to other to airlines around the world than what they had to say about the families of all these folks that were literally destroyed by their actions and inactions. Okay. So the basic question in our complaints, the allegation is that Boeing was negligent in the design and certification of the 737 MAX. They have two choices when they answer the complaints that were filed today. There's two choices given to you in federal court. You can admit or deny. Boeing should come to court in their pleadings based upon the evidence everyone has and that they have 
and make sure and admit they were negligent and pay these folks 100% compensation for the loss of their loved ones. I can tell you this, if they deny they're negligent, we are going to seek every single email, text message that was between them and the FAA. We will hire computer experts if they don't give it to us and ask courts to allow us to scour their computers to find out how the process was shortened here so Boeing could get this aircraft out in the market and compete with Airbus. We will, we will, every stone in the process will be unturned if they deny liability. So, Manat has a prepared statement, then maybe a few comments afterwards. So, can you go down? Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Manant Vadia. Today is another sad day in my life. I lost my parents. Panagesh and Hansini Vadya, my sister Kosha, my brother-in-law Prerit, and my nieces Ashka and Anushka, two young teenagers. It is hard to believe that my entire family was wiped out in an instant incident in such a horrific way. I still cry, and my wife Hiral still cries when we think of the horror of the last moments of our loved one lives. It is affecting my family and is very hard. My daughter Manasvi, just, just last week, was sitting in an exam and she could not do well as she started crying during the test. My, Manas, my daughter is in grade 10, so it's, it's like terrific tragedy to her as well. While driving with my wife, we suddenly get tears in my eyes. In a way, it's it's quite dangerous for both of us because while, while we are driving, I mean, uh, we get too emotional and, and we don't know what to, what to do. I am being now more like a robot, uh, now just following up our daily routine. Get up early in the morning, brush, go to the work, back from the work, sleep, and that's about it. Uh, my sister and brother-in-law had saved up for years to make this memorable trip for the family. They were heading to Safari in Kenya. They wanted to spend time together as a family, doing fun things. Instead, they all died together because of the insensitivity and greed of the maker of a plane and others who didn't care about the very passengers they promised to protect when that plane and so many like them flew people around the world. I'm here to get answers. I owe that to my family that died thousands of miles away. I have nothing left of them to cremate. Instead of hearing them tell stories of all the adventures they were expecting, there is silence. There is total silence now. My wife Hirol and I will no longer be silent. I mean, I, this morning you were able to uh, see on TV the press conference by Mr. Mullenberg, the CEO He's of Boeing. Tonight. Yes. This morning you were able to view on TV the press conference of Mr. Mullenberg, the CEO of Boeing. Do you have any reaction to that? If it's possible to ask these questions via media, I would just ask like two questions. First question, why were the 737 MAX 8 planes not grounded and not immediately investigated right after the Lions aircraft? If something would have been done after the first crash, which just occurred just a few months ago, this might have been prevented. I could have my family back from the vacations sharing the stories. So the first question really is that why wasn't it the planes were not grounded. I mean, they are grounding right now after the second incident, right? But after the first incident, if it would have been done, I'm pretty sure that their lives might have been uh, prevented. The second question I got is that uh, I heard uh, him saying again and again that he ha his company has followed all the designs and certifications 
and there were a sequence of events resulted into the crash. End of the day, if everything was followed, how could the crash still occur? There is something wrong in the process. There is, something, there is some flaw in the process for sure. If, and he keeps on telling that all certifications were done. I mean, how can someone certify the plane which are flawed? So again, the second question is that, how would they ensure the safety of the, the plane, right? They, they keep on saying that they are going to be getting the planes again back in the sky. How are they going to do that? I mean, what, 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 how they are going to ensure that this doesn't happen again? I lost three generations of my family, my parents, my sister, my nieces. How, how I mean, if a person just, just lost just one life, they're like, a whole life is shattered. But right now with me, I'm more like, I don't know. I'm completely lost right now. Uh, so I'm just hoping that like this doesn't happen to any other families in the world. So I just want to make sure that Boeing is doing everything they can uh, and making ensuring that the safety is the most important and nobody else like me actually happens to get these things to again. So these are were, these were the two reactions uh, which occurred to me, right? I mean, that needs to be done more. Just stating that we had done enough, I don't agree with that. Farrell, do you have a statement to make too? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hiral Vaidya. I am Manan's wife. I also am sister-in-law, daughter-in-law, and aunt to the most wonderful family I have ever known. And I'm blessed to be part of their lives. When Manant and I received the horrible news that our entire family was on the Boeing 737 MAX 8 plane, we were in shock. Friends and extended family members tried to comfort us, but nothing could stop our endless grief. Of course, our family will never be the same. Manant and I, along with our two children, knew we had to go to the Ethiopia to gather the remains of our loved ones. We wanted to take them to home, homeland in India so we could do proper rituals. Yes, there was nothing left of them. We had nothing to cremate. We want their soul to rest in peace, but we cannot have peace in the way that our loved one died in the horrific tragedy. And in the way that no remains were properly preserved or recorded. Our family still stay up nights. We cry. We hold each other tighter. We cherish every, every moment together. Somehow, we think they will return, but we all know they will not. We have no closure, we have no peace, and no answer. So we pray that somehow one day we will get some sort of closure from this terrible tragedy that will be with our family into eternity. Raul, did you, uh, you viewed the conference this morning also by Boeing. Do you have any reaction to that? Yeah, I heard what CEO Boeing said this morning, even though I don't understand all of the technical words, terms, what he said. I just want to say none of this, his words, will bring our families back. So, and we don't want to any other family to be suffer same what we suffer right now. It will be our goal in this lawsuit to take that CEO's deposition and request the court to allow that and ask him questions about his changing positions, his shifting positions on accepting responsibility for this tragedy. Paul, um, you have a prepared statement to make to the thanks. media? Sure, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Njeroge, and on March 10th, I woke up to see a Bloomberg alert on my phone that Ethiopian Airlines flight ET302 has crashed. The flight number was in my head because I knew that was the flight I had booked for my family to travel with. 
it became a horrible nightmare to me. I wanted it to be that they had missed the flight. And so I called my brother-in-law and he confirmed it to me that my entire immediate family had perished in the flight. I lost my beloved wife, Caroline, and our three little children, six-year-old Ryan, four-year-old Kelly, and baby Ruby, just nine months old, in the crash of the Max 8 plane. I was left alone to live an empty life with pain and anguish. My life will never be the same. To lose your entire family is an, in an instant is something that is impossible for human beings to come to terms with. And I feel blessed that I have the sanity to be here today. We had our entire, entire lives before us. We looked forward to years and years of happy memories. My wife and I had many plans for our family, to see our children live fulfilling and successful lives. But instead, I'm left with nothing, without a home, because I have no home to go to. My wife was a dedicated homemaker. She was a full-time mom and a full-time accountant. Our children radiated joy and happiness. Ryan was exceptional in class and always looked forward to playing games with me. Kelly would sing every day to me. Ruby would dance to the tunes of Kelly's singing. With their brilliance, I believe that our children would have changed the world. My wife and children were traveling from Toronto to Nairobi. The children had not seen their two grandfathers and one of their two grandmothers in almost two years. It would have been the first time for Ruby to be with a larger family. They were all eager to get there, but they never made it. I stay up all nights crying, thinking of the horror that they must have endured as pilots struggled to keep the plane flying for six minutes. The terror that my wife must have experienced with little Ruby on her lap. Our two children besides are crying for their daddy. My mom-in-law feeling helpless besides her. <coughs> Those six minutes will forever be embedded in my mind. I was not there to help them. I couldn't save them. It was up to Boeing and the others in charge to save them. We paid for a safe flight. But instead, my family and others in that plane have suffered a profound loss that can never be mended. We are here to ensure that planes remain flyable and safe for human beings, that no lives are lost again because of the negligence of plane manufacturers and aviation regulators, that no one leaves this earth in such a tragic and painful manner. Nobody should go through what I and others, my aunt here and his wife, what we have gone through since March 10th. You know, it, it's my prayer that God rest their soul in eternal peace. And I hope that someday I'll, I'll find some peace because I don't have any peace. Thank you. Paul, do you have a reaction to the press conference yourself this morning? The CEO of Boeing? One thing that he said was that uh, Boeing followed all procedures and certifications in the design of the 787 MAX 8. And, you know, I ask myself, if that was true, why was the Ethiopian Airlines flight ET302 unflyable on March 10th? I may not be an aviation an uh, engineer or an aviation analyst, but right <coughs> You know, according to the preliminary report issued by the European Aviation Authorities, as soon as the MCAS system triggered, the aircraft behavior became very erratic and the pilots could not save it. So I do believe that there is a lot that Boeing uh, as a company is not telling us. And if they fully and, and truly sympathize with us, they should unequivocally accept their mistakes. Thanks. Thank you. Frank, do you have some comments? Sure. I, like many of you today, listened to Boeing and their CEO say as he began his press conference that he was sorry. And I think what we've heard here today is that there is a lot to question 
about the sincerity that Boeing has when it uses the words, I'm sorry. If you look at the actions of Boeing, it portrays a very different picture. On April 4th, the CEO wrote a letter, and in that letter, he stated that Boeing owned the problem. Five days ago, April 24th, his statements can only be interpreted as denying that there was any defect that led to the deaths of 346 people. I'm going to quote his words. There is no technical slip or gap here, referring to a conversation he had with Wall Street analysts. He added during that same analyst call that actions not taken contributed to the crash. That's code for deflecting liability to pilots and others. So I question, and I think these families here today question the sincerity behind the words, I'm sorry. The CEO today, Mullenberg, had the opportunity in response to the question to indicate whether he would resign. He totally dodged that question. If you look at the actions that were taken by Boeing leading up to this crash, one can only conclude this is failed leadership by Boeing and the entire board should resign. Consider this. The actions that were repeatedly taken to show that safety was compromised or risks taken when the decision to do the safer thing and the right thing was ignored. Consider the missed opportunities that Boeing took during the design phase, insisting that this aircraft did not have to be recertified as an entire aircraft, the airframe, the engines and the controls, but rather choosing to say the only thing that needed to be recertified were a few bits and pieces, piecemeal certification of a 1968 model aircraft. That was a choice by Boeing and their management. Deciding that critical information about the angle of attack and whether it was accurate or not could rely on but one single sensor, not two, that could point out inconsistencies and avoid a single point of failure leading to a catastrophic event. That's a choice by Boeing. Three, choosing to keep the operational function and characteristics of the MCAS system a secret from pilots. That was a Boeing choice. Four, choosing to make a critical safety feature a warning light that would advise pilots that there was information inconsistent about the angle of attack that could have avoided this type of crash and making it optional equipment to be purchased at an additional cost. <coughs> That's a Boeing choice. Five, insisting that pilots don't need more training for everything they knew about this aircraft, that they could take one hour on an iPad and it'd be done. That's a Boeing choice. Six, issuing misleading statements after the Lion Air crash about safety concerns and leading people, pilots, to believe that the plane was safe as opposed to disclosing everything they knew. Seven, the most recent revela revelations by several whistleblowers about all the safety concerns regarding other models that were being manufactured at a South Carolina facility. Eight, the most recent stunning revelation by Southwest Airlines that, they, that Boeing actually had deactivated the angle of a disagree warning light before Lion Air, yet represented that it was 
a safety feature that was on the aircraft when they sold it. Now, after 30, 346 lives have been taken, Boeing says that they're going to change and they're going to do all the things that they knew about before this aircraft had been certified and they're going to correct that in the newly certified plane, they claim. They say their software updates are going to change significantly. That they're going to have both sensors that are going to operate and send signals as they should have before to correct misinformation. That the power of the system that was used to control the horizontal stabilizer would be lessened so that it doesn't have the same degree and effect in having that plane nosedive. That as standard equipment, we're going to have that warning light when the sensors provide information that disagree and fully disclose about the defects in the MCAS system. Why now? I think the thing that has everybody upset is that I'm sorry is too late. Leadership of Boeing has failed. And if this company is to ever gain trust for the traveling public, the board has to re resign. Shareholders should vote them out because that's not the company, Boeing, that most Americans thought of. I'm just sorry that I have to sit here with these two families today to address these <coughs> comments. Thank you for your time. Does anybody have any questions? Today during the news conference and at the shareholders meeting, uh, the CEO said that it's not necessary for every pilot to get simulator time even after this plane is reintroduced. He said most of it can be taken care of with the computer. Do you have concerns hearing that? I know uh, Mr. Petrie touched upon the fact that an hour with an iPad, is that a substitute for putting your hands on the controls and learning how to fly an airplane? In, in my opinion, no. And the people that they should be talking to are the people who actually fly planes and asking them what kind of training they think they need. Let's get input from the people who are behind the, the, these aircraft and have to fly these aircraft as to how much training they need. But I think it's totally inadequate to suggest that you're going to take a plane that has caused these calamities and you're going to put somebody behind an iPad and say that's sufficient training. These folks need training and I, and I think uh, Sully Sullenberger has so indicated himself that he hopes that more training will be provided. So let's listen to the pilots. Anyone else? Charlie? One more Do you still have concerns about the certification process and the close relationship between Boeing and the FAA in getting even this software patch out? Absolutely, and it was even reinforced more this morning. I think anyone knows tenant in life. You have to accept there's a problem before you correct it. And what I heard this morning was no accepting of a problem. I heard him say our certification <coughs> process was correct and we did it correctly. Well, that's obviously so false. So what's happened over the years is the over-reliance on the FAA in allowing what they call designating engineering representatives from the company to actually certify the aircraft. So here what you've had in this case was the majority of the certification process was Boeing employees, okay, with the company pushing to get this aircraft in production to compete with Airbus, deciding if the aircraft was properly certified, but they're supposedly wearing an FA hat when they do it that. At the end of the week, when they get their paycheck, it says Boeing on it, not the FAA. So it is a conflict of interest in how they do that. There should be much more oversight. And I, as I believe, in, in direct answer to your question, my reaction to it from what I heard this morning is 
They don't even admit there's a problem with the certification process, so they cannot be trusted, in my view. You have anything? Why not? No, I think you said it all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Paul? Okay. Let me, let me pop up another question here, which is you mentioned 1968, which, of course, was the main year, the full, first full year the airplane was in service. According to airsafe.com and looking at the statistical chances of any generation of 737 going down from the classics to the NG all the way through, the NG is now phasing out in favor of the MAX, the, the rate of accidents on those successions of airplanes, which changed over the years, has dropped until now. So what was it about the MAX, in your view, that delivered us these two accidents as devastating as they are? Well, you, you. sure. <clears throat> you, I mean, if you go through historically, what they had to do is to keep pace with Airbus, <coughs> is they decided to jerry-rig the MAX. They put on bigger engines to become more fuel efficient, and when they did that, they had to change the f configuration of where those engines were located. They pushed them forward, they're bigger engines and it changed the aerodynamics of the aircraft. So this wasn't some, you know, minor little change. This was a change that had complete aerodynamic effects on the plane and caused the plane to behave like a bucking bronco when it was taking off. Powerful engines, the nose bucked up. Boeing saw what was happening. They didn't want to retrain pilots, so what they did is they devised the MCAS system. The MCAS system was a secret that they had put in to have the nose when it was having that uh, angle of attack move downward so you wouldn't get that bunk bucking sensation. And what they did is they put a Band-Aid on a design that they knew had hazardous characteristics. So that's the change. And, you know, unfortunately, we had to have two events happen. Um, it, it's just outrageous how somebody tried to manipulate the system. It's outrageous how they tried to just cover up within themselves what they were doing and left pilots unaware of these hazardous characteristics so they knew what was going on. Charlie? I don't want to, don't want to take over the news conference, but sure. does, do, do these two incidents and the revelation about the cooperation between the FAA and Boeing does it raise questions for the rest of the industry at this point as far as oversight of governments in the design and manufacture of these aircraft? I think you can presume that if, if the certification process is working like it did in this case, where it's a faulty process, these design errors, which apparently were known, they knew there was a problem with the 737, the way they moved the engines, and let's try to fix it. Can you imagine that? We got a bad design of this aircraft, so we're going to create a system to assist the bad design, okay? So what trust can we have with Boeing and the FAA in this case on other aircraft, especially since they say this morning the certification process we have is fine. That is so obviously intellectually dishonest and an insult to these families that the certification process was fine. And if they think it's fine, they cannot be trusted in the future with any certification process of any aircraft until they admit how they were at fault and correct it. You know, this goes back to 1980. There was a congressional investigation into the inner workings of the FAA and whether they were acting um, as an overseer, a watchdog, if you will. And there were a number of different problems that were identified then, loopholes in the system, exceptions that uh, overwhelmed the rules, issues regarding resources. We have all of these things that continue today that are problems and deserve to be investigated. Is the FAA, do they have the resources, do they have the technical experience that is necessary to act as a watchdog? Because that is what has led to more of the responsibility for certifying aircrafts falling on the shoulders of the very manufacturers who are trying to get certification. You have a conflict of interest here. So I think there are some serious problems. I think those serious problems need to be investigated by uh, Congress, and a report should be issued about the problems and fixed, and fixed immediately. 
Does anybody have any questions of Paul, Manat, or Hurrah? If you have any questions of them, they're welcome to, they will answer those. Well, I would say that most important thing for anyone is the safety of the human being, right? So I'm hoping that whatever needs to be done is done and no lives shattered. As, as we experience a loss, we don't want any other families to be experiencing the same loss. So that is what the justice means to me. How the the right things do and how the things which needs to be done holds for the future generations of ours, yeah. Paul, you got an answer for that? Well, justice to me is that planes are flyable and that they're all safe. They are safe for all human beings. Hello? I will, I will stick with what Manan said. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.